Uh, let's all kneel for a word of prayer at this time. Save to serve international. First time viewers online joining us. Let's spend a few moments in prayer. Father in heaven, it's a privilege to bow in your presence on this your holy Sabbath day of rest. We're thankful for your work on our behalf in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And today we come boldly to the throne of grace. We see our need for mercy. We see our need for grace to help in time of need. Bless us now, we pray. Grant us repentance. Grant us revival and reformation. Feed us with fresh bread from heaven's bakery, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. I want to begin with a statement here coming from Testimonies for the Church, volume 5, and page number 546. Notice what this says, brothers and sisters. Our people have been regarded as too insignificant to be worthy of notice. But a change will come. A what will come, my friends? A change will come. The Christian world is now making movements which will necessarily bring commandment-keeping people into prominence, and we are going to see that today. There is a constant supplanting of God's truth by the theories and false doctrines of human origin. Movements are being set on foot to enslave the consciences of those who would be loyal to God. The lawmaking powers will be against God's people. How many souls are going to be tested? Every soul will be tested. Volume 5, page 452. God has revealed what is to take place in the last days. That his people may be what, my friends? Prepared to stand against the tempest of opposition and wrath. Those who have been warned of the events before them are not to sit in calm expectation of the coming what? The coming storm, comforting themselves that the Lord will show to his faithful ones in the day of trouble. While men are sleeping, while men are sleeping, one more time, while men are sleeping, Satan is actively arranging matters so that the Lord's people may not have what? Mercy or justice. Mm, mm, mm. The Sunday movement is now making its way in darkness, brothers and sisters. And today I want to focus on a grand theme. And that is a great memorial. And what is today's date, brothers and sisters? October 23rd, 2021. And what date was yesterday? October 22nd, 2021. And what is that a great memorial of? Relating to Jesus Christ. Come on, brothers and sisters. Christ moving from the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to begin the work of investigative judgment. And that work has been ongoing for the past 177 years. And Christ began pronouncing verdict upon the cases of the dead. But we are told very, very soon he will come to pronounce verdicts upon the cases of the living. And that would take place at what great event, brothers and sisters? The mark of the beast. Please notice these references. Great controversy, page 491. Look at the red words on top. Underlined, it says, soon, none know how soon, it will pass to whom? The cases of the living. And when will this take place, my friend? Look at that. Volume 6, page 130. It takes place at the mark of the beast. I'll give you a third. Great controversy, page 605. The final test comes at the mark of the beast. There it is. Look at the fourth. Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 976. At the mark of the beast crisis, Jesus comes to pronounce 
verdicts upon the cases of the living based on my decision and your decision when the son of the law is enforced. And the great question is, based on that song, how shall I stand in that great day? How shall we stand in that great day? Shall we be found wanting or shall we be found with all of our sins? Finish that. Thank you. All of our sins wash away. How shall we stand? We will either receive the seal of the living God and be saved or receive the mark of the beast and be lost. And Satan is making every arrangement so that God's people will not find, not have mercy, nor justice in these last days. But the majority of God's people are sleeping. But by God's grace, I want this message to arouse us, to arouse us to the work of preparation and the work of duty. Now, when I understood October 22nd was coming, 2021, I was actually praying and preparing a message to give a Bible study to confirm Daniel 8:14, to confirm October 22nd, 1844. But the Spirit of God says, No, you shall not. That's not where you must bring my people today, October 23rd, 2021. Oh no. Give them another perspective. And friends, are you ready for this perspective? The perspective is, brothers and sisters, we're now seeing that people in the world and in the church are now mocking October 22nd, 1844. They're mocking the fulfillment of Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. And that is not anything new. It happened in scripture and this is where we're going. Brothers and sisters, we are told, as it was at the first advent of Jesus, so it is going to be in the last days. The apostle Peter, who was first the disciple Peter, could not deal with mockings. He could not deal with mockery. The finger of scorn was pointed at him. Peter could not tolerate the mockery. And as a result, what did Peter do, brothers and sisters? What did Peter do three times? denied Jesus three times and if we are not prepared to stand for Christ Jesus in these last days when the mockery become more scornful the majority of God's people just like the disciple Peter would deny him deny his truth and be lost even though Peter had an opportunity to return to Gethsemane and find godly repentance and made his calling an election sure, many of those people in these last days, that is going to be their final decision and they won't have a second chance to make their calling an election sure. Am I ready? Are you ready? We are told, my friends, in the book of The Desire of Ages. And page number 83, that we must study the closing scenes of Christ's earthly ministry. Well, one of those closing scenes, Christ predicted that the Gentiles, the whom? The Gentiles would mock him. Go to Luke chapter 18 with me. Where are we going to, my friends? Luke chapter 18. And look with me, brothers and sisters. This is going to be, by God's grace, my friends, bread from heaven's bakery. We don't want to be served from Jezebel's table. We want bread from heaven's bakery. Look with me at Luke chapter 18. The Bible says in verse number 31, if you're there, just say amen. It says, then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. Does that intimate prophecy? Verse 32, for he shall be delivered unto whom? The Gentiles and shall be mocked. What did Christ predict would transpire? The Gentiles would do what? Would mock him. Skip on down to verse 34. Did the disciples understand what Christ had just said? The Bible says, and they understood none of these things. None of these things. Friends, scan verse 35. All the way down to verse 43. What is in that scene? Who received? What is in that scene? Verse 35 through verse 43. Scan it. What happened there, my friends? You find a blind man receiving restored sight. Amen. 
I wonder why. Because it's a juxtaposition. While God's 12 disciples understood not what he was saying, the coming prophetic fulfillment of that prophecy, that crisis, here we have a blind man receiving restored sight. And the question is, are we blind? We better say we are blind. And then come to Christ based on Revelation chapter 3 and say, Dear God, you promise that if I buy, if I see my need, I can buy the heavenly eye salve to have my eyes anointed. Great controversy, page 594 says. So in the prophecies, the future is open before us as clearly as it was opened to Christ's disciples by his words, the events connected with the close of probation and the work of preparation for the time of trouble are clearly presented. But multitudes, how many? But multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths as if they had never been revealed. And Satan watches to catch away, to snatch away every principle of truth. That would make us wise unto salvation and the time of trouble. The time of trouble will find many unready. I don't want to be in that group. How about you, my friends? So Christ prophesied the Gentiles would mock him. But before I deal with that, let's not overlook. I, I, I cannot be remiss and not share with you, my friends, that Christ professed people also mocked him. That came first. They mocked him, and when they mocked Christ, what did they say? They said, if you be the Christ, come down from that cross. If you be the king, save yourself. What prophecy were they mocking? Look with me, my friends, at Mark chapter 15. Where are we going to, my friends? Mark chapter 15. And look with me at verse number 31. And if you're there, my friends, just say amen. Are you there in Mark chapter 15? Are we there, my friends? In Mark chapter 15, the Bible says in verse 31, Likewise also the chief priests, who? The chief priests, mocking, said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let Christ the King. Let whom? Christ the King. Two titles. Let Christ the king of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. Were they blind? And they that were crucified with him reviled him. Brothers and sisters, what were those two titles? Christ and king. What prophecy were they mocking? Why were they mocking Christ? They were actually seeing that Christ had professed he was fulfilling this particular prophecy, but they were mocking him. And by mocking him, they were also mocking that prophecy. What scripture in the Old Testament mentions Christ and King that Christ would fulfill? Talk to me, my friends. What is that prophecy? Thank you. Daniel chapter 9. Note that, my friends, it's on the screen. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, the 70 prophetic weeks. And verse 25 mentions the coming of the Messiah, the Prince. The whom? The Messiah, the Prince. What does Messiah mean? Give me another synonym for the word Messiah. The anointed one or Christ. And what does Prince, what does prince mean? Prince means a king. Luke 23 verse 2. Look at this scripture. John chapter 1 and verse 41 confirms Messiah means Christ. All right, Isaiah chapter 10 and verse number 8 says, Prince means king, Messiah the prince, Christ the king. What prophecy were they mocking, brothers and sisters? And remember, remember the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, verse 25 to verse 27 is intimately connected with what other prophecy? Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. It's two parts of the same prophecy, two parts of the whole. And the first part related to the Jews. Daniel 9, verse 24 through verse 27. But now watch, the latter part pertains to what generation? The final generation, which began what date? 
October 22nd, 1844. And both prophecies began in what year, my friends? 457 B.C. Autumn. And the larger prophecy came to an end when? October 22nd. What date, my friends? 1844. Go back with me to, to Mark chapter 15. And remember, I'm coming to the fact to show you how the Gentiles were mocking Christ and what it represents today, but showing how Christ's people first began to mock him and to mock the fulfillment of Daniel chapter 9. Are we seeing that today, my friends? Today, we have begun to see. It's no new thing. Profess Seventh-day Adventist pastors, professors of theology, administrators, elders, deacons, laymen, so-called evangelists have begun to mock the fulfillment of Daniel 8.14. They reject October 22nd, 1844. Today, this scripture is being fulfilled in our ears. It's right there on the screen, my friends. I wished I had the time to go through what happened in 1955 through 1957 within this Seventh-day Adventist denomination. The men from Babylon, their names are Walter Martin, and we have Donald Bornhouse. And they said the Seventh-day Adventist cannot profess to be a Christian denomination if they hold on to October 22nd, 1844, if they still hold on to that, that means they are a cult. And what did the leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination do? The majority of them came together and published this book. Let me get that. Those two books back there, bring them for me. Seventh-day Adventist answer, questions on doctrine. That's it, my friends. And here we have Emil Andreessen, pastor, educator, all right. Here it is, my friends. Thank you, Christian. Letter to the churches, Emil Andreessen, and questions on doctrine. This is the book, brought, well, in my right hand over here, right hand, amen. There it is, my friends. There it is. And notice what Emil Andreessen wrote regarding what was printed in Seventh-day Adventist answer Question on doctrine, it says, the question of greatest importance was whether Adventists could be considered what? Christians, while holding such views as the doctrine of the sanctuary, the 2300 days, the date 1844, the investigative judgment, and Christ's atoning work in the sanctuary in heaven since 1844, our men, meaning seventh Day Adventist leaders, our men express the desire that the Adventist church be reckoned as one of the regular Protestant churches, a Christian church, not a sect. So what did they do, brothers and sisters? They repudiated, come back here, Christian, they, these two books here. They repudiated October 22nd, 1844. I'm going to read you a statement shortly. They repudiated the official principal application of chapter 8 of Daniel and verse 14. Notice what this says, my friends. Was it prophesied that within, among Seventh-day Adventists, that they would reject the doctrine of the heavenly sanctuary? It's right there. It was prophesied today. This scripture is being fulfilled in your ears. And what is both the foundation and the central pillar of the Advent faith? What is that doctrine? Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. If you reject the foundation, the house falls. If you despise and tear down the central pillar, the house falls. And the house represents the church. Falling condition, my friends. Here it is. Watch carefully, my friends. They wrote, blue words, it should be understood that we, SDA, simply mean that Christ is now making application. That means Christ's ministry is not literal, it's symbolic. That is a travesty, to say the least, brothers and sisters. And now we must change Sister White's writings 
to support that there is no literal day of atonement, no literal investigative judgment, no literal, I'm telling you my friends, 1844, October 22nd, they wrote, this is from the apostates from Babylon, these doctrines, the evangelicals had called the most colossal, psychological, faith-saving phenomena, phenomenon in religious history. Blue words are Seventh-day Adventist Christians, and we said in no uncertain terms, no, we are not. <laughs> or we said, yes, we are, but by dumbing down our doctrines. In God's eyes, if you reject Christ and present truth, you are no longer his, because Jesus says, my sheep, Hear my voice, and what do they do? They follow me, brothers and sisters. These preachers within SDA are mocking our foundation and central pillar. They have begun to eat from Jezebel's table. They are drinking in Babylon's wine, the wine of false doctrine, and what separates the Seventh-day Adventists from Babylon, Roman Catholics, false religions, and the apostate Sunday denomination. Brothers and sisters, it's October 22nd, 1844, Daniel 8, verse 14, the investigative judgment. So these preachers among SDAs, as they're eating from Jezebel's table, they are no longer God's preachers, but now they are Satan's bartenders. They are serving wine, the wine of Babylon, brothers and sisters. Hold on there. And in the year 2003, the leaders of SD, SDA had the unmitigated goal, the audacity to reprint the book. SDA's answers, question on doctrine. What a bitterness here, my friends. Don't, by the way, that book, I did not waste God's money to buy it. Someone gave it to me. Amen. <laughs> Notice here, my friends. And here we have Desmond Ford before he passed away. He, he clearly said the majority of the administrators as well as the professors at Andrews and other institutions have already rejected Daniel 8.14, October 22nd, 1844. That's where we are, friends. Mockeries, SDA mockers, that's what we are seeing. The one project says, those who believe in October 22nd, 1844, those who believe and preach Revelation 14, verse 6 to 12, those people have paranoia. Those people have paralysis or perusia. The mockers, Seventh-day Adventist mockers, brothers and sisters. There it is on the screen. But remember, that's not my focus. That is not my focus. That has been going on for decades. The point here is, have we come to a time where in Christ's prophecy is now being fulfilled that Gentiles will mock October 22nd, 1844. Have we come to that point where the Gentiles will mock faithful Seventh-day Adventists? Have we come to that time where in the Gentiles will mock the investigative judgment? Have we come to that time? If so, it's time to be ready. Go with me, my friends, to Luke 23. Where are we going to, my friends? Look with me at verse 35. Did the Gentiles mock Jesus Christ? The Bible says in Luke 23 and verse 35, if you're there, just say amen, my friends. It says, and the people, I wonder how many pulpits among the Seventh-day Adventist believers are going to be focusing on October 22nd, 1844 today. If not, it must show you, my friends, how deluded and topsy-turvy these preachers are, discombobulated. They need to be straightened up. Look at verse 35 of Luke 23. It says, and the people stood beholding. And the, who? the rulers, underscore rulers, and the rulers also with them derided Jesus, saying, he saved others, let him save himself. If he be whom, what is that title? If he be Christ. All right, verse 36, and the soldiers also mocked Jesus, coming to him 
and offering him vinegar and saying, what did the Gentiles now say? If thou be whom? The king. So what were they also mocking? They were mocking the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. Does it make sense, brothers and sisters? And that is a part of the whole. So in the last days, expect the Gentiles to be mocking Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. October 22nd, 1844, the investigative judgment and those who live, teach, and preach these present truth subjects. And the Bible also says, we may know when the last day comes, there will be a great number of mockers. It's the last days. And why will there be mockers? Because they are rejecting the Holy Ghost. Because they love sensuality. They love ungodliness. They love the things of this world. Why? To accept October 22nd, 1844 is to accept that we are now living in a time of investigative judgment. If you believe that, you have to take a 180 degree turn from the wrong way to the right way. But they don't want to change. They don't want to become converted. They don't want to surrender all to Christ. So what do they do? They find an excuse to reject the message, thinking that they can numb their consciences. But remember, great controversy, page 597 says, ignorance, what did I say? Ignorance is no excuse for error or sin when there is every opportunity to know the will of God. Go with me to the book of Jude. Jude only has one chapter, my friends. Where are we going to? Jude. Only one chapter. Look with me at verse number 17 of Jude. If you're there, my friends, I'll give you a few. Are you there now? Jude chapter 1. I know some of you are taking notes. Jude chapter 1, look with me. At verse number 17, are we there, my friends? It says, But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be whom? Talk to me. There should be mockers when? In the last time. Why would there be mockers, read on, who should walk after their own what? Ungodly loss. These be they who separate themselves. These be they who are sensual. These be they mockers, having not the Holy Spirit of God. Again, why would there be mockers? Of October 22nd, 1844, they think if they can just remove that from their minds, that they will not be judged accordingly. Why are they mocking October 22nd, 1844? My friends, because it brings our minds to the investigative judgment. Quote with me, Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and verse 7. Is this not the everlasting gospel? Quote with me, after these things I saw... Another angel, fly in the midst of heaven, having what? Thank you. The everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, what my friends? Fear God and give glory to him. Why? For the hour of his judgment is come, October 22nd, 1844. Read on. And worship him that made heaven earth, the seas, and the fountains of waters. So what is the pivoting statement in verse 7? Why must we fear God? Why must we give God glory? Why must we worship God? Because the hour of his judgment is come. Can you now see why they would reject and mock October 22nd, 1844? Because they do not want to fear God. They do not want to give God glory. They do not want to worship God as creator. What do those three things mean? What does it mean to fear God? Come on, Proverbs chapter 8, scribble that down. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 13 says, For the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, arrogancy, the evil way, and the froward, the filthy mouth conversation the forward mouth do I hate what does it mean to give God glory my friends first Corinthians chapter 10 come on scribble that down first Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31 says what's everything you watch ever you eat 
whatsoever you drink, and whatsoever you do, do all to what? The glory of God. They don't want to be a healthy farmer. Whatsoever you eat and drink, and that's why many in the world, and even profess, not all, many profess SDA, would reject and mock October 22nd, 1844. For to believe in October 22nd, 1844, you have to also believe in health reform. And akin to health reform in the year 1863 was dress reform. Amen. And also recreation reform. Whatsoever you eat, whatsoever you drink, and whatsoever you do. That's lifestyle reform. Then the Bible says, brothers and sisters, and worship him who made heaven, earth, seas, and the fountains of waters. So why should we worship God? Based on verse 7. Because he's our creator. On what day should we worship God? On Sunday? Because he, he is our creator. No, my friend. On what day? Go with me to Lamentations chapter 1. On what day, friends? On God's seventh day Sabbath, not Sunday. It's easy now to reject October 22nd, 1844. Why, my friends? The people in the world do not want to worship God on his seventh day Sabbath. But let me now add with no ambiguity. Those profess, not all, those profess Seventh-day Adventists who mock October 22nd, 1844, very, very soon, they will keep Sunday. <laughs> they will deny this faith and keep Sunday. So now, here's my point. Watch my theme. From mockers to receiving the mark of the beast. That's it. They will, get, they will abjure God's seventh-day Sabbath and keep Sunday the mark of the beast when it becomes the law of the land. But let me not go too fast. What Scripture says, we worship God on the seventh day of the week, commonly called Saturday, because he is our creator. What is that text? Talk to me. Exodus 20 and verse number 11, verse 8 through 11. That's Old Testament. Give me a New Testament scripture, my friends. We worship him on the seventh day of the week because he is our creator. Come on, talk to me. What if this were a question? If you get it right, you go to heaven. Get it wrong, you go to hell. What would be your response? Come on, talk to me. Mark 2, 27, 28. Okay, many will say, well, that was before Christ died. So give me a text after Christ died, rose, ascended in the New Testament still. Come on. Hmm, what now? As creator. Yes, Acts 13, Acts 15, Acts 17, Acts 18, Acts 19. Good text. But as creator. Hebrews, put it down. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 8 to verse 11, brothers and sisters. That's the text. That's the text, the nail in a sure place. And the Bible says that there's going to be mockers of God's October 22nd, 1844, the investigative judgment. Why? They do not want to honor God in getting victory over sin. They don't want to be lifestyle reformers, health reformers, and be what? Sabbath worship reformers. They want to hold on on Sunday worship, or they really want to worship themselves. They want to work on God's seven-day Sabbath to make more money. And many of them believe, if I have to hold on to the seven-day Sabbath, it's going to stymie me, me from uh, ascending the corporate ladder. Big career, high paying job. I have to be available on the seventh day of the week. So what do they say? Well, there's no judgment. Thinking that is an excuse, brothers and sisters. Listen to what I say now. We are told, my friends, in the book, Great Controversy, page 527. We are told, brothers and sisters, many are finding hooks to hang their doubts upon. It says, while God has given ample evidence for faith, he will never remove all excuse for unbelief. And those who look for hooks to hang their doubts upon will find them. And those who refuse to accept and obey the word of God until every objection is removed. And there's no longer an opportunity for doubt will never ever come to the light. I don't want to find hooks to hang my doubts upon. That's what they're doing. 
the SDA pastors and professors and administrators hoax to hang their doubts upon and they mock October 22nd, 1844, just as those in the world. They're mocking God's Sabbath, Lamentations chapter 1. Where are we going to? The Bible says, my friends, in verse number 7, and if you're there, just say amen, my friends. Verse number 7 said, look at the last phrase of verse 7. By the way, I'll read all of it. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, God's church, remembered in the days of her affliction and of her miseries, all her pleasant things that she had in the days of old, when her people fell into the hand of the enemy, and none did help her. Let's read the last phrase, what it says. They asked adversaries saw her and what did mock did mock did mock what at her sabbaths brothers and sisters mocking the god's sabbaths they want to mock the investigative judgment message and my friends the bible goes on to say that those who mock october 22nd 1844 those who mock the investigative judgment must also take the next step and mock and reject Christ's resurrection. Why is that so? The Bible tells us the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the assurance that there will be an investigative judgment. So those who mock October 22nd, 1844 and mock the investigative judgment but still believe in Christ's resurrection, that is the epitome, the zenith, the apex of hypocrisy. Go to Acts chapter 17, brothers and sisters. Where are we going to, my friends? Acts chapter 17. The Bible tells us in verse number 31, and if you're there, oh, let me give you a few. Acts chapter 17, look with me at verse number 31. And if you're there now, just say amen, my friends. Are we there now? The Bible says in verse 31 of Acts chapter 17, because Jesus, because the Father, the Father hath appointed a day in the which he will do what, my friends? Judge the world. A day. What day is that? October 22nd, 1844, a day has been appointed in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whom he hath anointed. To ordain someone, you anoint that person, whereof he, the Father, hath given assurance, uh, underscore assurance, assurance unto all men in that he hath what? raise Jesus from the dead. So what is the assurance that there will be an investigative judgment? The resurrection of Christ. Look now at verse 32. The Bible tells us the people now when they heard that, they reject, they mock the resurrection. That means they would also mock the investigative judgment Daniel 8, verse 14, October 22nd, 1844. The Bible says, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some did what, brothers and sisters? They mocked, the Bible says, they mocked. And the Bible goes on to emphasize why Satan, why Satan, how many of you believe in the resurrection of Christ? Raise your hand, my friends. Even those of you online, Save to Serve International, and first time viewers, do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? So what else must we also believe based on Acts 17, verse 31 and verse 32? What else must we believe, my friends? That there's coming a day in the which God will what, judge the world in righteousness. And what is that day? The day of atonement. On that day, the cleansing of the sanctuary. Of sin but before there can be a cleansing there must be an investigation October 22nd 1844 if that's clear my friend say amen. amen and the Bible goes on to say one great reason why Satan would inspire many why Satan would motivate many why Satan 
will also get people to mock October 22nd, 1844, that they won't believe in the investigative judgment because Satan knows if they mock the investigative judgment, they will not live accordingly so Christ can bless them. They can pass the investigative judgment and be saved. Once they mock it, they won't live based on God's word. So they are going to be lost. And if they're lost, their sins will not crush Satan's head. That's why he motivates them. Go to Leviticus chapter 16. What happened in Leviticus 16, verse 20 to verse 22? Verse 29 and verse 30. What happened on the day of atonement? What happened on the day of the cleansing of the sanctuary? The day of investigative judgment? What happened to all the confessed sins of the people? What did the high priest take those sins and do with them? Based on verse 20 and verse 21 of Leviticus chapter 16. What did he do with those sins? Look at the screen. What happened? He placed the surrendered sins of the people where? Not on the feet of the scapegoat that typifies Satan. Not on his shoulder. Not on his belly. But where? On his head. I wonder why. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 says, For the wages, the way, finish that, the wages of sin, finish it. The wages of sin is death. All right, pause right, of course, at what the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. All right, but now why on the head? The surrendered sins of God's people were placed. What prophecy has to be fulfilled from the book of Genesis? That's the hint. What prophecy? Genesis. About the head. The head. Genesis chapter 3. And verse number 15, and what did Christ say? I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It, Christ, shall what? Bruise thy head. That's it. That's it. Of course, bruise the heel of Christ. But that seed in the primary sense represents Christ. But have you forgotten? Revelation 12 and verse 17, against whom is the war? Assailing against whom? Um, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with whom now? Of her. The remnant of her seed. Come on. Which what now? Keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Watch now. If they're keeping the commandment of God, they're no longer sinning. Because the Bible says that sin is the transgression of God's law. So the remnant seed who are keeping God's commandments, they're getting victory over sin. And what will Christ do when Christ comes to their names? In the investigative judgment, before he seals them, he's preparing to take their surrendered sins and place them where? And place them where? On the head of whom are uh, Satan and what will happen to Satan's head oh my friends I will bruise your head and the Bible says in Romans Romans chapter 16 Romans chapter 16 and verse number 20 the Bible says and the very God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly, shortly. Oh, for I can't wait for that day, brothers and sisters. The bruising of Satan's head. No wonder, brothers and sisters, Satan will love to inspire people to reject Daniel 8.14. Do you see it now? Why? Those in the world and in the church to reject October 22nd, 1844. He's a sly old fox, brothers and sisters. That old serpent called the devil, the most subtle of all the beasts. Satan deceived the whole world. Either our sins will crush Satan's head or our sins will crush our head. Which one do you prefer? Talk to me. The former or the latter? The former my friends, I choose the former, my surrendered sins, crushing Satan's head, brothers and sisters. And the Bible goes on to say in the study that notice that not only 
will the Gentiles mock October 22nd, 1844, mock the investigative judgment, but they will also label us extremists. They will label us terrorists, brothers and sisters. This is another golden point. May I give you a Bible? The Bible, put it down, scroll it down. The Bible says in Matthew 26 and verse 61, Matthew 26 and verse 61, the Bible says, when Christ came to that judgment scene, the hall of judgment, in the time of Caiaphas and Annas, do you know what the false witnesses said of Christ? We heard this man saying three and a half years ago, this man, he's going to what? Destroy the temple. Destroy the temple. Who would do that? What would we call that person and those people today? Extremists. What would we call them today? Fundamentalists. What would we call them today? We would call them what? Terrorists, brothers and sisters. So what were they calling Christ? In the same scene as they were mocking that he was fulfilling, Daniel 9, verse 24, verse 25, they were calling Christ a terrorist. Luke chapter 23, go there with me. Where are we going to, my friends? Beloved, do you realize what happened January 6, 2021? What happened in Washington, D.C.? What were those people called? Hmm. What were they called? What has the media labeled them? What epithet are they now carrying? They're being labeled as fundamentalists. They're being labeled as extremists. They're being labeled as terrorists. What if I told you the same people who are now mocking October 22nd, 1844, who are mocking the investigative judgment, who are mocking Seventh-day Adventists, are also linking Seventh-day Adventists with Q? Anon, this scripture is being fulfilled in our ears, brothers and sisters. Remember, Satan is now arranging matters that God's people will not find, will not have mercy or justice in these last days. Luke 23, look with me at verse number two. Do we have order back there? Get that set. Verse number two, are we there, my friends? It says, and they began to accuse Jesus, saying, we found this fellow, and what did they say he was about? He was what? Perverting the nation. He was what? A perverter. What would we call that today? Come on, I just said it, my friends. In the same breath, they were calling him an extremist, a fundamentalist, a what now? A terrorist. Look at the next few words in the same verse. What else were they mocking? Watch now, a fellow perverting the nation, and what now? Forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is what? Christ, a king. Do you see it, my friends? As they were mocking Daniel 9's fulfillment, they labeled Christ a terrorist application. As they were mocking October 22nd, 1844, the investigative judgment, they will also label us as what, my friends? As terrorists. Are you ready for this? My friends, time is fulfilled. Jesus is soon to come. What's the headline there? Look at the, the date. The date, my friends. How QAnon does what? They use religion to lure unsuspecting Christians. Next. It says, uh, under somewhat similar strains, a group of 1840s Baptists called the Millerites, William Miller, the Millerites predicted the second coming of Christ. When Christ did not arrive, the Millerites were what? Great, greatly disappointed. But they adjusted their apocalyptic timetables and soldiered on, eventually becoming who? The Seventh-day Adventist Church. Travis View said he sees echoes, echoes of the Millerites in QAnon. In other words, he sees echoes of Millerites in QAnon. So my friends, based on that one statement, who else are being conflicted with the Q? I'm going to say Q for now. I don't want, you know how YouTube is. All right, my friends. Who are they calling 
people like the Q. Hmm. Seventh day Adventist brothers and sisters. Are you seeing what's happening here? Notice how a new religion could rise from the ashes of Q. Look at the date, brothers and sisters. What are they being called? Radical, social, mo calling us radicals? What laws have been put in place since September 11, 2001 to deal with radicals, to deal with fundamentalists, to deal with extremists, to deal with terrorists? Could it be that the same Patriot Act will become more draconian to be applied to faithful Seventh-day Adventist Christians, brothers and sisters? Look at this. It goes on. They mention the great disappointment, the Millerites, and now who do they mention? Red words. It was out of this group that who came about. The Seventh-day Adventist church arose. Blue words. What did they mention? The cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. Christ says the Gentiles would mock. Is the mockers here, brothers and sisters? Hold on. Hold on. Move on. It says, red words, the Seventh-day Adventists, they said, listen now, social, last sentence, social psychologists call this phenomenon cognitive dissonance. What, what does that mean? They're saying Seventh-day Adventists have what? Cognitive dissonance. What does that mean? That's your homework. What does that mean? That's your homework. What does that mean, brothers and sisters? What did they call Christ? Beelzebub. What did they call Paul in Acts 24? A ringleader. And we're told, my friend, when God's people reach a standard that God would have them reach, wordlings will call seven-day Adventists odd, singular, straight-laced extremists. Today, this scripture is being fulfilled in your ears. This quote Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 287 and 289, brothers and sisters. All right, now we come to Mr. Bill Maher. Give me some audio. Mr. Bill Maher is going to state that the progenitor, the father of Seventh-day Adventists is William Miller. Look at the date, brothers and sisters. Come on, release that. Listen, friends. Tonight, I'd like to tell you a tale of Dr. William Miller, the American preacher whose teachings spawned the Seventh-day Adventist religion of today. My friends, I can't play all of it. You know how the gatekeepers are. I'm simply going to give you some clips. Then he went on to mock the second coming of Christ. Listen. In the 19th century, Miller grew an enormous following by telling anyone who'd listen that he could by reading the Bible and then applying his own math <laughs> predict the exact date for the second coming, Jesus' big return to show business. Mocking. Now, what math could he be talking about? What math did William Miller have? What scripture? Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. Let me move on. And now they, go, they are going to mock that the world would end in October 22nd, 1844. Listen again. So peaking in the early 1840s, William Miller's rallies attracted thousands of people, all focused on this one idea, that the world was going to end on his predicted date of October 22nd, 1844. That is the day the world would come to an end. Spoiler alert, it did not. <laughs> Laughing, having a good old time. And now, now he's going to mock and say that Jesus just simply blew off William Miller and the Adventists. Listen. Christ totally blew them off. <laughs> he was supposed to show up and just flaked. Typical. Typical. All right, and then he's going to say we should never base our religion on any prophecy any scripture listen to this as he mocks now when you stake your whole religion on one all-important prophecy that doesn't come true the logical reaction from followers should be well i guess that was a bunch of mm -mm. hold on and friends he goes on to mock and to mock, write these two texts down. The Bible says, my friends, in John chapter 14, because it says, don't base your religion on prophecy. And friends, we have young people, parents, you have children. 
who are, who are among the woke culture. And many of the woke liberal folks out there, they are going to deceive your children to reject Bible truth. Why? They are much wiser than God. So they think, my friends, they are discombobulated, bewildered. Hold on. John chapter 14. Let me give you John 13 first. John chapter 13 and verse number 19. Jesus says, I tell you these things. Before, before they come to pass, that when they come to pass, you might believe I am he. So what was the central thing to get people to know who the Messiah was? It was based on prophecy. John chapter 14 now and verse number 29. Jesus says, I tell you these things before they come to pass, that when they come to pass, you might believe, brothers and sisters. They are mocking. Now watch. He goes on to mock the term, the great disappointment. Listen to this. Ready? No, no, this sect doubled down and to this day refers to October 22nd, 1844 as the great disappointment. <laughs> because of course it's disappointing when the world doesn't end, but the important thing is that you didn't let your faith be shaken in the guy who got it dead wrong. Mm -hmm. And now in the next clip, he's going to now link William Miller with the Q and Seventh-day Adventists with the cue. Listen and watch. Does this have to do with what's going on in the world today? <laughs> well, recently there's been another large group of people who had a great disappointment. <laughs> and, and will not accept their loss. Mm -hmm. And now he's going to call us a cult. Listen to this. A cult. And the challenge for us is how do you get people out of a cult, especially when every time you present evidence of what is obvious reality, they take it as proof of you being in on a conspiracy to destroy them. And so friends, think about this. Did we not cover earlier how the men from Babylon came to the SDA leaders and said, you are a cult unless you surrender October 22nd, 1844 and the investigative judgment and give up your belief in the writings of Ellen White. Now the Gentiles now, the worldlings are now mocking October 22nd, 1844. Brothers and sisters, this scripture is being fulfilled in our very ears. The time is fulfilled. We are here. Jesus is soon to come. But before Christ comes, we have to go through a crisis. And many of these men, it's, it's, it's fun now to laugh. It's fun now to mock. But those who mock will receive the mark of the beast. Those who mock will receive the mark of the beast and be lost. It's fun now to laugh. But the Bible says that Christ will have the last Laugh. Hold your place in Luke chapter 23 and look with me at Proverbs chapter 1, brothers and sisters. Where are we going to? Proverbs chapter 1. Christ will have the last laugh. Amen. And this goes not only for Bill Maher, not only for the, 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 uh, the, the, the group of men who came from Walter Bornhaus and Martin and Bornhouse, but even professed SDAs who are mocking October 22nd, 1844, mocking the investigative judgment. Mock now, laugh now, because one day Christ will have the last laugh. Proverbs chapter 1, look with me at verse number 24. Are we there? Jesus says, because I have called and you refuse, I have stretched out my hand and no man came. But you have set at naught all my counsel, and with none of my reproof, everybody read verse 26. What does Christ say? I also will laugh at your calamity. I will what now? Mock when your fear cometh. Mock now. Christ will have the final mock. Laugh now. Christ will have the last laugh. Come down to verse 27. And the Bible calls Christ having the last laugh. The Bible calls it a strange act. The only reason why he will laugh and mock at your calamity is because your probation has been closed. Look at verse number 27. When your fear cometh, 
as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind when distress and anguish cometh upon you then oh then oh then shall they call upon me. now they know Christ but I will not answer they shall seek me early but they what shall not find me not now and what came to my mind brothers and sisters you can go back what came to my mind in the time of Elisha, people are mocking October 22nd, 1844. There's no heavenly sanctuary. They were mock Bill Maher, Adventist, so-called SDA, not all, the majority, are mocking. They even, they even are very disingenuous saying that the Adventists leading up to 1844, that they went on and put on all white gowns. And they ran to a mountaintop waiting for Christ to come. Fables, brothers and sisters, fables. They are mocking people going to heaven. Do you know what came to my mind? Elisha. After Elijah was translated without seeing death, Elisha was right there by his side, brothers and sisters. As Elisha came down and began his public ministry, there were some children, some young people. You mean the woke culture? Yes, the woke culture. Yes, the woke culture. All oh, the cancel culture. And what were they mocking and jeering uh, Elisha and saying, Go up, bald head. Go up, bald head. Go up to where? What were they mocking? They were mocking people going to heaven, mocking the translation, mocking the prophecy. Go up, bald head. What happened? The Bible says, Elisha, curse them in the name of Jesus Christ. What happened thereafter? The Bible says two she-bears. Go to 2 Kings 2. Two she-bears, brothers and sisters. Two she-bears came out and, and tore them to pieces, to minces. Forty-two children were torn to pieces, brothers and sisters. Go up, bald head. Go up, bald head. Yes, keep mocking October 22nd, 1844. The she-beers are waiting for you. Not literally she-beers now, but the seven last plagues. The second death, fire and brimstone, brothers and sisters. Look at this. Are they mocking? Look at the screen here, friends. There it is. Bill Maher, who is he? Red words, my friends, on the line. He's a what? A professed atheist. But even the professed atheist one day, They'll be seeking God, but it is going to be what? Too late. Past that. Bill Maher mocks the Bible and mocks Christians and say they are a threat to America. I'm telling you. How, how much clout does Bill Maher have? How much influence does Bill Maher have? And of course, he's a great so-called journalist. Of course, he's a so-called comedian. But brothers and sisters, comedian? Remember, they will laugh and kill you, brothers and sisters. They will laugh and kill us. And that's why I'm saying to you, we are coming to a time where there is going to be a quick transition from mockery to martyrdom. From mockery to martyrdom. From mockery to what? Martyrdom. Who are going to be martyred? Not everybody, but some. Who are going to be martyred? God's commandment keeping people. God's Sabbath keeping people. Revelation 13, verse 15 to verse 17. And God's seventh day Sabbath is connected to what grand truth, brothers and sisters? The heavenly sanctuary. That's Revelation 14, verse 7. We worship God. Why? Because the hour, finish that off, is judgment is what? Let's move on. Get back to the screen. There it is. Past Elisha. There it is. And who are they mocking, my friends? There it is. They're mocking also God's inspired human messenger calling Ellen White a heretic. And friends, besides the Bible, not besides, in addition to the Bible, which, which volumes of books confirm October 22nd, 1844? Hmm? It's the writings of Ellen White. The mocking has begun from the Gentiles, brothers and sisters. Time is fulfilled. There it is. And they mention the Sabbath. Red words. Miller? Miller? Yes. Second, third line. William Miller. It's all there. Mocking. First line too. Mocking, brothers and sisters. Mocking. But what says, past that, what says Second Chronicles chapter 36, 
Verse 16, but they, let's sort of read, come on. But they what? But they mocked God's messengers, despised his words, misused his prophets, until what? The wrath of the Lord rose up against his people, till what? There was no remedy. Brothers and sisters, if you have friends, so-called friends, if you have family members who are mocking October 22nd, 1844, and Daniel 814, the investigative judgment, I implore you, I beseech you, flee from their company. If you are not influencing them to leave error to truth, they will influence you to leave truth. And now you begin to imbibe dangerous errors. It says, Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 17 says, I sat not, praise God, I sat not in the assembly of the mockers. Praise God. Nor did I rejoice among them. I sat how? Alone, brothers and sisters. How? Alone. Look at this. Look at the dates, brothers and sisters. Headline. How cults like you respond to what? Embarrassing failures. And look who they mention. How many articles do you need? How many authors do we need to see? The prophecy is being fulfilled. We shall be mocked by the Gentiles. Today, this scripture is being fulfilled in our ears. Red words. Who do they list and link, conflict with the Q? Seventh day Adventist Christians. And what do they call us? Conspiratorial missionaries. And the woke culture is going to make it an addendum to get people to reject present truth. Brothers and sisters, here it is. Look at the date, October 22nd, 2021, every year. That means, my friend, every year they hike to remember the day, and they call it the rapture. The day the rapture did not happen. Spoiler alert. Brothers and sisters, this is a perennial mocking. Every year they are mocking and mocking, and one day from mocking to then martyr us. Oh, brothers and sisters. Let me say this, my friends. Some of you cannot conceptualize that. How long did Christ's public ministry last for? How many years? How many years? It lasted for three and a half years. If you were walking with Christ, looking at the beautiful Jewish church and the Roman power, if I told you that within three and a half years, they would mock Christ and then kill Christ, you would have said, I don't believe that. And today, in 2021, October 23, 23rd, the mockings have begun. Then what is the next step? Martyrdom from mockings, from mockery to martyrdom. Could it be within three and a half years? Am I ready? Are you ready? It's not going to start and stop simply at mockery and mocking. It's going to progress from mockery to what? Martyrdom. Am I ready? Am I preparing my children? Oh, you are scaring my children. They don't want to come back to safe to serve. They don't want to watch online services. Why? Because Pastor Henriquez is driving trepidation in the hearts of my children. Don't deceive yourself. Don't deceive yourself. You should be more fearful if you are ignorant. More fearful if you're unprepared. My friends, Christ was 12 when he understood he would die as a human. 12. The first time he went where? To the Passover. And what did he behold? The slaying of the lamb. And he understood what his mission was. At what age? 12. And that's why I now say one of my favorite quotes for the last uh, one month is Ministry of Healing, page 502. Ready for either the plow or the outer is my prayer. Ministry of Healing 502. Ready for either the plow or the outer is my prayer. The plow, keep on working. The outer, to lay down my life as a sacrifice for Christ, his truth, and the salvation of souls. Do you not know that the tech giants may shut this video down? 
I'm willing to bear that persecution just to set somebody free. Amen. Go to Luke chapter 18 with me, my friends. Some of us are in a, a world of fantasy. Many of us are daydreaming. We need a spiritual alarm clock. Within three and a half years, it went from mockery to martyrdom. No, of course, I'm not saying Christ was a martyr. Martyrdom here is being used loosely. I love M and M. From mockery to martyrdom. From mockery to crucifixion. From mockery to persecution. It's coming for us. Look at the progress. Luke what chapter, brothers and sisters? In Luke chapter 18, look what the Bible says, my friends. Luke 18, look with me. At Luke chap look with me at verse number 32. If you're there, just say amen, my friends. It says, For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles and shall be what? Did it say period, mock period? Or do you see a comma? And what came next? After being mocked, what happened, friends? He would be spitefully entreated. And what next? Spitted upon. Verse 33, and they shall scourge him. And what now? Put him to death. Five things. Do you see it, my friends? It's coming for God's people from mockery to martyrdom. It's time then to get prepared. How many of us want to be prepared? How many of us want to be prepared? And the first way to get prepared is to know what you believe. And also, spending time with Christ. Because knowing what you believe intellectually without having daily communion with Christ will do you no good. What do I mean? Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God in Matthew chapter 16. And Christ said, flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. But in Matthew 26, when the time of trouble came and they began to mock and put the finger of scorn upon Peter, what did Peter do in response? He denied Christ three times. And why? Because Peter was sleeping when Peter should be what? Watching and praying. We need to know what we believe. Luke chapter 21. We, past that, I don't want that yet. We need to know what we believe. Because all of us will have to give a, a testimony of why we believe what we believe. It's right there. Three scriptures, my friends. Note them on the screen. Write them down. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Now, watch carefully, my friends. Watch carefully. Who was the preacher among the Adventist believers leading up to October 22nd, 1844, that came up with that date. What is his name? William Miller? It was not William Miller. My brother, Samuel, everybody now, say it together. Samuel Snow, don't forget that name. Look at the screen, my friends. What are we told in last day events, page 209? It says, it does not seem possible to us now that any should have to stand how? Alone. But if God has ever spoken by me, that time will come. Did Peter have to stand alone? When we shall be brought before councils, before thousands, for his name's sake, and each one will have to give the reason of his faith. Everybody, read that line, black words underlined, what it says now. Then will come the severest criticism upon how many? Every position that has been taken for the truth. What is the last sentence now about preparation? We need, since this is coming, we need then, not coming, since it is what? It is here. We need then to study the word of God that we may know why we believe. The truths that we now preach, we now advocate, we now promulgate. Why do we believe what we believe? Amen. All right, look at this. Look at the world. They know what we believe. But they twist it. Look at the date. This is February 2nd, 2021. Look at the headline. Q and the Great Disappointment of 1844. Now, my point here is, look what they wrote. 
When March 21st, 1844 came and went, they were greatly disappointed. Many latched on to whom Samuel Snow's refinement of Miller's work, which revised the date to October 22nd, 1844. These people know what we believe. As a result, they can twist it to deceive do we know why we believe the truths that we know advocate? But pastor, that's one news article. Look at a second, <laughs> a second one. Look at Vox. Look at the date, March 3rd, 2021, the future of Q. Skip on down. Who do they mention? Red words, Seventh-day Adventist. Who do they mention? Look at the red words on the line. When Christ did not make his return on that date, Miller apologized for the error. But another Millerite preacher who? They know our history. You can mock what you don't know. You can deceive people if you don't know what they believe. Do we know what we believe? It's time for preparation. Many times I'm in the office and I hear Hillary with the children in the, in the little area, school area, and I hear her drilling down their throat, as it were, drill, instilling in their minds, leaving an indelible mark upon their minds what present truth is, and Christian has to get up and go by the board and actually explain Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14 and go through all of it, and faith does her little part. We have to prepare, 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 volume five. It's past that, it says, and there are many in the church who take it for granted that they understand what they believe, but until what? Controversy arises. They do not know their own weakness. How many people listen to Bill Maher and the rest? Only Americans? Go look at his sub subscriber base on social media. Listen, when separated from those of like faith and compelled to stand singly and alone to explain their belief, they will be surprised to see how confused, how confused are their ideas of what they had accepted as truth. God will arouse his people. If other means fail to arouse us, heresies will come in among us. Which will what? Sift us, separating the chaff from the wheat. We have to get ready, brothers and sisters. It says, and this preparation, we must make how? We must make daily, brothers and sisters. Go to John chapter 11. We must make daily Maranatha. Page 255. We must make this preparation daily. I'm hoping that this will arouse us. Because God's people are asleep. And while men are sleeping, Satan is arranging matters that God's people will not find mercy nor justice in the land. The Sunday movement is making its way in darkness. John chapter 11. I'm still on the theme of preparation, brothers and sisters. When Christ understood, it moved from mockery to martyrdom, do you know what the Bible says? Christ fled to the country. The Bible says that. I couldn't believe it. Mark, John chapter 11, mark it. John what chapter? Yeah. Within three and a half years, it moved from mockery to martyrdom. What's coming for us? Look at this. That's why I believe it's not accidental we see these uprisings going on in America. Because they have to link, the devil has to link God's faithful people with these pagans. He has to do it. Or so-called pagans, so-called extremists, so-called, he has to do it. Because he wants one group, that small group. You think Q can hinder Satan? Q can't stop him. The world culture can't stop Satan. It is one group because the issue is over what? Worship. Come on, brothers and sisters, understand this. John chapter 11, look at verse 53. It says, Then from that day forth, they took counsel together for to put him to what? Yes. So from mockery to death, 
from mockery to martyrdom. What now, says verse 54, Jesus, therefore, what now, walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence unto what? A country near to where? The wilderness. Go with me, my friends, to Genesis chapter 19. It's preparation. Parents, if you have grown children who are mocking you, I don't want to hear about country living. You better be like Lot and leave them alone in modern day Sodom and Gomorrah. And why did Lot's children mock him? Did Lot not tell them there was coming a great crisis? Did Lot not say, up, oh, get you out of this place, for God is going to destroy this place? What does the Bible say? They mock Lot. And the same thing is transpiring today. You may have a sibling you told, you know what, uh, sis or brother, bro, I'm getting ready for the country. And they're mocking you. Mockers, a sign of the last days, brothers and sisters. But what happened to Lot's two daughters who married men from Sodom? Who laughed last? Who laughed last, brothers and sisters? They were destroyed in their mockeries. What is God saying to us? Genesis chapter 19. What is God saying to us? And I know young people, you are around your peers. Be careful of who you associate yourself with. Psalm 1 verse 1 says, Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the one, the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. In that law doth he what? Meditate day and night. Uh, Genesis chapter 19. And he shall be like a what? A tree. Not a salt. Not a pillar of salt, my friends. On the plains of Sodom. Look with me at verse 14. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place. Why? Get you out of this place, for God will destroy this city. But he seemed as, what were they doing to Lot, their father? They were mocking their father. And may I say, parents, be careful. Don't allow your children as we would say in the Jamaican vernacular, don't allow your children to backtalk you. As young as, don't allow these young ones to backtalk you. That's a great disrespect. They are violating the fifth commandment. And as they grow, then the backtalking and the disrespect turns into what now? Mockery mockery and they will be the same ones to turn on you in the last days because they are possessed with demons and that's why great controversy page 592 and 597 says be careful of the silken cords of affection and what are those silken cords of affection <laughs> parental parents filial sons and daughters Mocking you. And what else? Conjugal. Your spouse. And what else? Social. Your friends. The silken cause of affection to cause you to be lost. Mocking you and mocking God's present truth. It's time, brothers and sisters. It's time to get ready. And notice, when Christ understood, it moved from mockery to martyrdom. Where did Christ find himself? The Bible says in an upper room. And what was he doing in the upper room? What was he serving in the upper room? Come on, friends. He was serving what? Bread and what? Wine to get ready to the transition from mockery to martyrdom. But before they ate the bread and drank the wine, what happened to them in the upper room, friends? They had to wash their feet, which typifies what? cleansing the ordinance of humility surrender all to christ make it right with your wife your husband families get right marriages get right with god and with each other sibling with sibling trample on the foot sibling rivalry lay aside pride selfishness the twin demons it's time and then we can partake of the flesh 
of the Son of Man and drink his blood, the life of Christ. And then when Christ understood from mockery to martyrdom, he said, disciples, come with me where? Come with me where? Into Gethsemane. And what were they to do in Gethsemane, my friends? To watch and pray, to watch and... So what must be our experience now? We are seeing the mockery, from mockery to what now? Being spitefully entreated. Then what? They're going to spit on you. And they're going to scourge you. And then what? Martyr you. Five things in the list. From mockery to martyrdom, it's coming. Am I ready, brothers and sisters? Are you ready? But now, is there any hope, friends? Is there any hope? Go with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 18. Is there any hope? Look at this. The Bible says, watch carefully, for he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles and shall be mocked, spitefully entreated, spitted on. They shall scourge him. And then what? Death. Let's read the blue words. Verse 33. And the third day he shall what? Rise again. Is that hope? Every time when Christ preached, Crisis is coming. Great time of trouble. He made sure he presented a message of hope. I will rise again when? The third day. Amen. Did they crucify him? Did he lay down his life for us? Was he placed in a grave? Did they think they could hold him there? Oh, friends, they went to Pilate and said, please hold, put, put a stone and block him because he said he would rise again. Okay, go do it. Put a seal there. They did everything to keep Christ down. But what happened? Christ rose. Now, let me tell you something. Satan is going to arrange matters in your life to keep you down, to keep you dismayed, to keep you discouraged, to keep you depressed, to keep you down. But Jesus says, you shall rise. You will rise. The Bible says, my friends, in Proverbs 24 and verse number 16, a just man falleth seven times, but riseth again. We shall rise. And why will we rise? Because Jesus rose. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. And the Bible says, for what? The Lord himself shall descend with a what? The shout, the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God. Let's read now. Let's say it now. And the dead in Christ shall rise. We shall rise, brothers and sisters. It doesn't matter what the boss men say. Get pricked or no job. We shall rise. It doesn't matter what your medical diagnosis is about your sickness. Let's say it together. We shall rise. Oh, my, it doesn't matter what they're planning. The papacy, apostate Protestants, the Sunday movement is making its way in darkness from mockery to martyrdom. Hold on. We shall rise, brothers and sisters. Isaiah chapter 60 and verse number 1 says, Arise, shine. Why? For thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. You shall rise, brothers and sisters. Don't you forget that. He shall what? Rise the third day. Go with me, my friends, to Hebrews chapter 11. Let's bring this to a close. Hebrews chapter 11. We shall rise. You remember John chapter 5? There was a man who was impotent. He was downtrodden, not for three days, but for 38 years. But then he grabbed hold of Jesus and believed his promise. And verse number 8 of John chapter 5, Jesus says, Arise and take thy bed and what walk. And the man believed and he walked. That's faith, brothers and sisters. Faith in the word. It doesn't matter how long you have been pressed down financially, socially, in your marriage. It doesn't matter how long you have been pressed down by disease, by trials, temptation. Remember, believe God's promises. Surrender all to Christ and say, I shall 
Arise by God's grace. Hebrews chapter 11, my friends. Look at this. Christ always presented hope along with the crisis. It's coming. Don't be in a gaze, my friends, thinking if you don't believe it, it won't happen. He, even Peter thought that would work in Matthew 16. Be far from thee, Lord. This would never happen. Get thee behind me, Satan. Did Peter's unbelief stop the crisis from mockery? To martyrdom? No, my friends. Let's get ready. It doesn't matter what you're going through. Always say, I will rise. Amen. You may not rise the first day or the second, but a third day is coming. Amen. If it's not the third day, still believe until the saving of your soul. I will rise. Hebrews chapter 11, my friends. Look with me at verse number 36. If you're there, just say amen, friends. It says, and others had trial of what? What? Oh, thank you, you're there. What will we have to go through? Mothers, fathers, young people. It says, and others had trial of what? Cruel mockings. Skirt up. Uh, Scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. You mean we have to go through imprisonment? It's right there. From cruel mockery to imprisonment. Do you see it now, friends? But what? We shall rise. I didn't hear all of you. We shall rise. By whose grace? By God's grace. Come to verse number 37. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the word was not worthy. They wandered in deserts, in the mountains. That's coming? Yes. In the dens? Yes. In the caves of the earth, my friends. It doesn't matter if we have to flee. And we will have to flee. But remember, we shall rise by God's grace. And that's why the Bible says, Come boldly to the throne of grace, that you may obtain what? Mercy. And find what? Grace to help in what? In time of need. The subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by God's people. All need a knowledge for themselves of the position and work of their great high priest. Otherwise, it would be what, friends? Impossible for them to do what? Exercise the faith. What are we going to need, my friends? The faith which is essential at this time. His position, high priest in the most holy place. His work to intercede, to blot out our sins, and to grant us our needs. Believe, have faith. Faith, my friends. Faith in the ability of Christ to save us amply and fully, entirely. His way in his time is the faith of Jesus. I believe today, October 23rd, 2021, I will rise by God's grace. How about you, my friends? One more time. We shall rise. Come on, by, by God's grace. Pray with me, friends. Father in heaven. Who today say, Lord, I recommit my life to you? Why not raise your hand right now? And for the rest of you online, and for those of you who have already made that decision to be baptized, Lord, hands down, Lord, seal every decision today for baptism and recommitting their lives to you. Thank you for this word. Save us. And we thank you for this saving grace of Jesus. And the church said, Amen. Amen.